this beautiful community of people who are spreading the selfless love of Jesus across the face of the earth. And in terms of where we're at in our, in our church life, uh, it, especially if you're new, it's good for you to know that we are and have been since September been doing a home church kind of model uh, for, for grassroots so that uh, like this is the last Sunday in, in April. And on the last Sundays of every month, we've been meeting like this in the larger group setting. Um, but the other weeks of the month, we've been doing uh, some small groups, sometimes up at church, other times through Zoom. So uh, continue home group, people in home groups continue to stay tuned for, uh, for emails from your leaders. That's the best those are, that's the most direct, I think, channel of communication we have. But we also have a weekly newsletter. We have to have some Facebook accounts, um, ways to get connected in that way. So um, uh, feel free to, to reach out if you uh, would like to get connected. Uh, in terms of where we're going in the longer future, um, we, we're gonna continue on in this way for the time being, um, but of course, of course summer is coming and last summer we were able to get outside a bit in worship and that's on our minds as well as the weather gets warmer uh, and into the summer and into next year, the, the leadership of the church, the board and the leaders of the church will be processing as, uh, as things open up as the pandemic comes to an end, which feels like from this vantage point, it may always be on repeat, a Groundhog's Day kind of year. Uh, but uh, this will end, we will be through this and we will be moving forward. Um, so we'll keep in prayer together about that. So there's not much else here to share today than a word of encouragement to you guys as we all, I think, are all digging down deep into our internal reserves right now uh, to find that place of resilience. Um, so if you're struggling today at all to find your footing in general, uh, you're in the right place. You're among a community of people who are uh, figuring it out, doing our best. All of us in our own way have been knocked down. Uh, we've been in our denials. Uh, we've, we've been in all sorts of places and we're just all here in a, in a messy, beautiful kind of way as we're tempted, I think, to flail around a bit. Uh, but as a church, uh, together, uh, we're seeking to ground ourselves in God, who is unshakable, who is like a solid rock to us. And as we remember, as part of, part of why we're here this morning is to remind ourselves, to remind one another um, that we need to give our hope and our strength to God. We need to find our balance in, in him. He is a solid rock. So God is here uh, in times of trouble, in times where we need strength. And we're here in his presence to, to link ourselves into him again. So let's take a moment before the, the songs begin. We'll have a, we'll song, some songs today. We'll do a sermon. We'll, again, we'll do a communion element um, and then um, we'll do a benediction at the end. So let's take a moment for all of us, wherever we're at today, from wherever we're coming to remember that God is here. He is strong. He is ancient. He is wise. He is among us and ready to hold us fast. His hand is on our heart and on our shoulders today in a posture of protection. And he longs to heal us and lift us up today if our hearts will allow it. So as we enter into this time, let's just say a quick word of prayer. Father, you are unimaginably wise. You are unimaginably close. And as we uh, come to you today from what, whatever posture of life, whether it's full of joy and excitement, or whether it's full of sorrow and grief, whether it's full of um, pain and sorrow or uh, times of rest and contentment, all of us come from different angles to meet you here this morning in the center place of Jesus Christ. And uh, we come to you not leaving the truths of our life behind, the realities of our life behind, but we gather them all up and bring them into your presence this morning as you are strong enough even to carry the loads of a whole community. So we love you, God, and we turn our hearts to you in song now, praising your name. Amen. So 
I, I'm assuming everyone can hear us now. And uh, in this empty room, um, as I look out and I now feel like I can say something without any, uh, there's no feedback, right? Uh, there's no one, no one here to say, Matt, you can't say anything, you can't keep talking. So with that in mind, I had a thought and, and I'm going to, I'm going to share this thought, and I've been on the computer end of this, so I know that my voice is probably coming through your, your little crackly speakers, and, and there are kids maybe running around and whatnot. So I'll keep it short, hopefully. Uh, my thought is, as we sit in this empty room, us on this end, uh, and, and begin you know, to sing songs and worship, I was thinking, isn't it interesting how at different points in our faith journey and just just kind of generally moving around our day uh we we can take for granted those things that if we were to have them today we would celebrate yet when we have them we, we don't know to celebrate them perhaps as much as they could be and so my example this morning is it's tough it's tough to be in an empty in empty grassroots church and I recognize now how much of a blessing, how much of a, a godly provision it is to be together and, and share a space together and just see each other's faces. Um, it's incredible. What a, what a difference that would make today for us to be able to do that. Um, but I don't want to say that in despair. I want to say it with with an encouragement that where we are today if we all could look around there are blessings that surround us today that we may be taking for granted things that are just beautiful about our existence are beautiful about the provision of god that if we didn't have them today uh, we would certainly know it so as we sing we're going to sing the lord is my salvation um, we talk about in times of waiting, times of need, uh, when I know loss, when I'm in weak. I know his grace will renew these things. The Lord is my salvation. Um, you know, there, there are complexities surrounding, you know, various things that are challenges in our lives that don't feel like they're going to be resolved. But today, my encouragement is as we sing this song, as we worship, let's recognize, let's really, let's really focus in on those areas of our lives where we, we can really see God at work. Let's look for them this morning. Grace of God has reached for me. from the raging sea and I am safe on the solid ground the Lord is my salvation I will not fear when darkness falls His strength will help me scale these walls. See the dawn of the rising sun. The Lord is my salvation. of his word winter fades I know spring will come the Lord is 
lives by salvation Times of waiting, times of need When I know lost, when I am When I reach the final day, He will not leave me in the grave, but I will rise. He will call me. This, this next song we've done, I think, once before, but it's not super common. Um, so if you don't know it, feel free to just focus on the words and, uh, yeah, latch on to this theme of God's love, his strength, his security that he has for us in these challenging times. Heavenly Father, Always amaze me. Let your kingdom come in my world and in my life. Give me the food I need to live through the day. Forgive me as I forgive the people that wrong me. Far from temptation, deliver me from the evil one. I look out the window, the birds are composing. Not a note is out of tune, or out of place. to the meadow and stare at the flowers at a dress than any girl on a wedding day so 
why should I worry? Why do I freak out? God knows what I need. Covenant, his blood 
song we're going to sing this morning is Psalm 62. And some something I always think of when I sing this song is um, Jesus' words, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, and I will give you rest. And I think something that we desire more than anything as humans is rest for our souls. And so listen, listen to these words as, as we sing them. rest in God alone, my rock and my salvation, a fortress strong against my foes, and I will not be shaken, though lips may bless and hearts may curse, and lies like arrows pierce me, I'll fix my heart on righteousness, I'll look to him
more. Father, as I look across the screens this morning and see all of these beautiful faces, um, I'm just uh, reminded of how how rich each one of our stories is from childhood to uh, family life to the situations that you've brought us through and put us in. And while I don't know everyone's, the full extent to everyone's story or how you're working in each life here, I know that um, you are working so intimately and perfectly at the complexities of our life. And so this morning, as we come as a group to pray together, what a privilege it is to hold up the prayers of this community in this moment to you. Um, this morning, as we as we think of, um, as, we, as we hear these words, as we sing the songs, Father, I know in, in my heart, there's so many things stirring up that might feel like distractions, but actually there are probably more places where you're uh, whispering into and uh, ministering to things that I'm worried about, things that I'm anxious about, things that I'm grateful for, things that uh, make me feel sad and uncomfortable and things that make me joyful. And I'm, we just recognize this morning as we, as we move into a time of uh, sitting at your feet as your students in, in your word, we know that um, you are a God who is with us and in ways that we can't even imagine. So this morning, as, as I lift up these prayers, as we begin to put our, our hearts and lift them up into, into your hands, no, no, some, some of us and most of us probably have individual prayers, but um, this morning I'm praying for the, the community as a whole. I'm praying that you would continue to bind us and knit us together. Would you continue to um, grant us a sense of fellowship uh, and open our eyes to the awareness of each other? Um, would you uh, help us to uh, forgive those who we need to forgive uh, you help us to soften the criticisms and judgments that we might have against the people that rub us the wrong way um, would you open our eyes to the fact that we are your sons and daughters we are your princes and princesses really we are your we have that hidden nobility in us of being your children because you are king and you are lord of this whole universe and so we um, Father, I pray for um, anyone today who uh, might be feeling discouraged in their life or discouraged in any possible way. And I pray that you would uh, whisper into that discouragement words of promise that you are a God who will finish the, the work which you complete. Uh, that you are a God who um, does not leave or abandon us, even when it all may feel like there's darkness around us. Now, those words from Psalm 139 are coming to my mind just now that uh, even though darkness may surround us, darkness is not darkness to you. For you, uh, your light casts away the darkness. And I pray that for those who need that in their lives this morning, they may even feel that as, the, as you minister to them uh, through the music and the, and the words that the a, a, a light may come into our lives. For, for those, Father, who may be finishing things or just beginning th new things, I pray that you would give them good endings and good beginnings, um, especially if it has to do with, um, yeah, like school or, or um, uh, relationships in their life that are maybe just beginning. I, I pray that you would, uh, you would infuse yourself into those places. Uh, and for those who just need the strength to keep on going in their life right now, who, who feel like maybe they're at a thin place, uh, recognize that you are a God of thin places in which the heavens and the earth become thin when we are in the most need. And so would you help them to hold on? Would you help them to have hope? Would you help them to see that there's future and steps ahead of them that include life and love and happiness and uh, most of all, a fellowship with you? God, this morning as we open your word now, we say that we're grateful and we are trusting of you in our lives. God, we love you and we lift all these things up in your name, Jesus. Amen. Okay, well, good morning again, um, Grassroots. For those of you who may have tuned on a bit late, 
Um, I'm, I have to be at home today uh, as, as I deliver uh, the message. So uh, I hope you can hear well. I hope the tech is working. We've worked out a lot of bugs, but we're just praying for internet to work and, and whatnot. So if there's any uh, tech complications, we'll just figure it out on the fly. Um, I told the crew, if it all gets really weird, just push end and we'll say that the power went out. <laughs> but uh, it should work. And um, yeah, there are a few different buttons you can push to uh, to make sure that you're seeing my face if you'd like. Um, but if you can't figure that out, don't worry. Just, just roll with it. So let's open the Bible again today here and see what the Lord has in store for us. For all of you who were here uh, for Easter a few weeks ago, this message is a continuation of last sermon, but there's no doubt in my mind that I, I should probably do a little bit of an extended introduction or extended recap of last time because uh, a thousand days uh, are like a day in the sight of the Lord and three weeks in a pandemic are like three decades. So uh, do you remember Easter was only three weeks ago? Probably not. Uh, that's a reality. That's a real thing. Uh, so last time at Easter, we were with Mary Magdalene, uh, who was a close friend and a follower of Jesus, and Peter and John. They were at the tomb uh, of Jesus on Easter morning, with Mary getting the chance to see a few angels appear in the tomb, and just a few moments later, getting to be the very first person to see and witness the resurrected Jesus. And really, we were asking one central question last time, which was, what does it mean to be a witness of the resurrection? Like, so like Mary Magdalene, what does it mean to be a witness of the resurrection? So we talked about how uh, Jesus uh, came and gave a commission to his disciples to help free the world from slavery and the effects of slavery. Remember, he comes to comes to them uh, on Easter Sunday evening and says to them, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, it's easy to get distracted here from the real point of Jesus's commission with this totalizing kind of statement. If you do not forgive sins, they are not forgiven, as if Jesus is saying that the disciples on their most stubborn days in life have the power to withhold grace and mercy uh, from whomever they wish. That's not what this is saying. That's not God's way. God, God's way is freedom and rescue and wholeness. And in the Bible, if you've if you've done any uh, real study on forgiveness, you all you you know that forgiveness is always first and foremost about being free from the effects of idolatry. And idolatry is how we we can uh, act as humans, how the kind of ways we can start worshiping things in creation as if they're ultimate to our life. And freedom, biblical uh, forgiveness, is always first and foremost about freedom from idolatry. Um, and so God's work, as he's commissioning us, as he did himself and as he's commissioning us, is always about rescue and freedom. And that's how we join in. And Jesus says it here, as the Father has sent me, as you remember from last time, so I send you. And that means that it's not just that Jesus is asking us to go and to even simply preach the gospel, simply work on mission, staying focused, but that our lives are to be people of Jesus who are following in his way. It's almost like we're part of a chain link. God sends Jesus to free the world through sacrificial living, and we are the next link in that same mission to free the world through our own sacrificial living. So Mary, she's a witness to the resurrection. She saw Jesus, um, but central to what we discussed last time is the fact that Jesus is our template. If we ask the question, how are we supposed to go about being witnesses to the resurrection as followers of Jesus? 
we, we recognize first and foremost that Jesus sets the template. And that's where it's so important that we, at this point of our thinking, separate out the idea of um, being witnesses of the resurrection as distinct from being witnesses to the resurrection. You can't be a witness of Jesus's resurrection. Or sorry, you can't be a witness to Jesus's resurrection if you're not first, like Mary, a witness of the resurrection. And you might be saying, okay, uh, Keith, what kind of, that kind of makes sense. We're getting that. Uh, but we weren't there like Mary. We weren't there to witness the resurrection. So how can we witness to that if we weren't there to see it firsthand? Um, but watch how this works in the story. Uh, Mary, she was the first witness of Jesus, Jesus's resurrection, but the first witness of the resurrection, if you think about it, the first witness of Jesus's resurrection was Jesus himself. As he experienced, and who knows what this was like, as he experienced breath coming back into his body, uh, as he experienced the movement coming back into his muscles um, from rigor mortis, we he experienced his body being changed from, changed from a broken and dusty kind of um, body that can die to its elevated resurrection state. He experienced his wounds changing from open lesions to scars. Even Jesus needed to experience the resurrection before he then witnessed to the resurrection to Mary. And you see, so you see how this pattern goes. When we think about what does it mean to be a witness for Jesus in the world, this process has to play out of witnessing the resurrection and then witnessing to it. And then when Jesus witnessed his own resurrection and came and told Mary of his life, watch how he does this. He continues to set the template for us about how we are to be witnesses in this world. First, he comes to Mary disguised, as we talked about last time. He didn't come in and break through her questions or through where she was at in her processing. He came alongside of her disguised. So we might call that hospitality. We might call that a way of being which doesn't insert ourselves too heavily into people's lives uh, without coming alongside of where they are at and what their struggles are. So he comes into her not with a great uh, unveiling of glory, but with coming disguised as a gardener, and he reveals himself not right away, but at the right timing, an insignificant relationship with Mary. Remember, he just had to say one word, her name, Mary, and her eyes were open to the reality, which is Jesus. And that's, that's a template that he's setting, that he's in significant relationship with the person he's witnessing to. And then he comes to the disciples and says, blessings upon you, peace be with you. When we are people who are following Jesus's template way of being witnesses to the resurrection, we come as well to a place where we get where we give peace to people. And if we are coming to people, and of course we'll always disturb people. How disturbing must it have been to see Jesus walk through a wall and be alive? Of course we'll disturb people with the resurrection. The resurrection should disturb the brokenness of creation, but. We also come in and people will also feel a deep peace in the presence of a witness to Jesus. Um, and then and then he doesn't he doesn't come and give them blessings and say peace among them. And then as if it's a great catch 22 or a great uh, bait and switch where now he gets up and proclaims the full gospel with light radiating out of his eyes. No, he doesn't do that. He lets them next touch his wounds. We have to have grieved, as, as you remember me saying last time, we have to have grieved through our lesions of our life before we can hope to be witnesses because a huge part of being witnesses to the resurrection is experiencing on our own life the healing that happens as the resurrection power of Christ comes and works its way through ourself. Jesus comes to us as a gentleman who knows us well, wants us to touch him, and wants to touch us back with resurrection. 
And I think so much of our hesitancy to be witnesses to the resurrection is because we've seen people, perhaps ministers or, or people that we've encountered in our life who just witness out of their own, uh, uh, own howling pain. They're, they're, they have not experienced the resurrection power in a healing way in their life and they become witnesses in a way that uh, they start lashing out. And um, sometimes I think we can forget that we ourselves are called to be witnesses because of those examples in our life. We don't wanna be like that. Um, but isn't it amazing the way Jesus wants it to work? How he wants us to insert ourselves into the world, not a burst of energy, not like a global worldwide revelation right away. Jesus could have come back and just gone up 30,000 feet and revealed himself to everyone at once, but that's not his way. He's not running through the world like a, a red-eyed or bullhorned. And so he says to his disciples, as God has sent me, so I am sending you. And so like the early disciples, we have that question in mind. And I'm not going to go through this. I went through more of this last week. But we always have the question in mind. What does it mean to experience the resurrection? And to experience the resurrection is not easy. It doesn't just come. So much of, so much of us want resurrection to be easy as if it comes into life and it should be laid in our lap. And we should experience. And if we don't experience with little experience it with little effort then it must not be real we live that out of that way when we when we recognize that the the reality of jesus matches the reality of the world that we live in nothing in this world comes easy nothing nothing good in this world comes without fighting for it and working for it and uh, we know that when we live a life of what we might call laziness or we might call um uh uh what's the word i'm thinking of uh, just kind of the sense of being immobile, in, in, spiritually immobile, we know that life languishes, it kind of atrophies, it, it becomes a bit, um, a, a, a bit difficult to, to move around. And so uh, we all need to, to recognize that at some level, experiencing resurrection takes effort and takes work. And that effort starts with the effort of grieving. It's not that we just have to you know, squeeze resurrection out of our life. It's that uh, resurrection comes through the hard work of grieving, opening our eyes to the truth of life and how it works. And, um, and, and so often we find when we do that, life is so different than we have always wanted it to be. And this is ongoing work. But again, that's the question. We ex must experience the resurrection. And there, it starts with grief. And comes through our life and then we share out of it and this is where i'm gonna so i did a bit of longer bringing us up to speed and this is where part two really begins it's an interesting pivot uh, to think about the acts chapter one where we hear about the the resurrection from luke's uh luke's vantage point uh, jesus comes and and uh, spends time as a resurrected jesus with him for for many days but it's interesting to move to the very end of the book of Acts, like we're going to do today, uh, because it was it was it, Acts is the story of how the first followers lived out this experiencing of resurrection and moving to being witnesses to the resurrection. Uh, it's a story. The book of Acts is a story that narrates kind of the first few years of the disciples figuring out how to do this. Uh, and there's if you read the book of Acts and if. I would suggest you do it. Get into the Book of Acts. Um, give give it a good read through. It's uh, it'll do you a lot of a lot of good. I was thinking the other day that you know we we do sometimes struggle with um, studying the Bible, getting into it. It's it's all of our jobs. It's all of our uh, it's 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 the most direct way that the Lord speaks to us uh, through His His living Word. Um, and we think, well, that's difficult. We have a lot going on in our life. Of course, that's true. But, you know, I don't know if you guys are Marvel fans and are, are like watching now the, the Disney Plus versions of, of Marvel, like WandaVision and now Falcon and the, the Winter Soldier. Um, I don't know if you're into that at all, but if you are, you're probably also reading all sorts of um, um, articles online about the minute details about th these stories people wondering like why does the winter soldier and the falcon throw captain america's sword differently than captain america threw his or it's not his sword his shield why, why do they throw it differently than he threw it 
I'm telling you guys as a biblical scholar, that's the level of questioning with excitement and detail that, that, that you get into the scriptures and can ask. And so we, when we love something, when we're really interested, when we're really devoted to it, those things aren't a chore, but they become uh, curiosities, which we cannot shake. And so, uh, you know, I think get into the book of Acts, read it this read it beautifully. You'll find the story of hope just uh, moving through the book of Acts in such a beautiful way. But I, today we're going to go to the very end of, of the book, the last real story uh, in the book, which starts in Acts chapter 27, as the disciples and Paul here is uh, following the pattern of Jesus's resurrection. And we know the last story as the story of Paul and his shipwreck experience. And so as if you've read, read through the book of Acts, you know that Paul was preaching Jesus as king. And because of that, he was jailed because there was, was another king in the Roman world. His name was Caesar. And Caesar's uh, had his influence stretched across the Mediterranean world. And because Paul was preaching another king, he was put in jail. And he's you can watch in chapters 25 and 26 of Acts how... Paul is testifying to the resurrection and the power of the resurrection. And you hear his story of how Jesus encountered him, not just in a powerful moment of uh, appearance as a re resurrected Jesus, but how Paul's own story, his own hard edges, his own uh, zeal for, for hunting and killing down other people have been changed into a way of uh, into a way of loving and living uh, softly and with his passions purified. He, he ex has experienced the power of resurrection in his life and he's preaching about it beautifully. And so we meet him here in Acts chapter 27 as a prisoner of the Roman state really. Uh, and he's on trial. He's getting ready to be on, on trial for preaching the kingship of Jesus. And Luke tells us that and Luke is here at this point with Paul, and he's beginning to narrate because Luke was on this shipwreck as well. So um, Luke tells us that when it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. And so now we're, we're being thrust into the ancient Mediterranean world where the shipping the shipping industry on the Mediterranean Sea was a hot spot. And, and Paul, he's not on a slave ship. Uh, this, these are not slave ships that they get on, but a general ship that was that was um, maybe shipping passengers or or food or or supplies across the Mediterranean world. We know that that Egypt always felt so far away from Rome, but they had a a, a shipping lane that um, went straight on, so they could they could uh, get there quickly. Uh, so Paul's not on a slave ship, but he's uh, in the cha in chains. He's uh, being watched by a centurion, a soldier of um, the Imperial Regiment, which is uh, uh, Caesar's own guard. And and so he's under. He and a few other uh, prisoners are under their under the Julius the the centurion's watch. Um, and before they set sail, Luke tells us that this Julius allowed Paul to get some help from his friends. Um, so Luke and the person named Aristarchus, Luke tells us, are accompanying Paul. And so Luke tells us that as they started sailing, you get this idea of a ship full of different kinds of people. Paul probably in chains, sitting below with a few other prisoners. Uh, Paul, or Luke tells us that the winds were against them so that they kind of crawled along the, the north shore of um, the Mediterranean by Greece, or well, sorry, by Turkey. And uh, and because the winds were so hard against them that they weren't going as fast as they had expected. Um, and this was a great, great frustration. So they at, at, at a port city, Julius decides to get on a different ship to perhaps to get them to uh, Rome quicker. And Luke tells us again that this ship, well, you know, you can just imagine the scenario. There's an owner of the ship and a captain of the ship, and the ship is coming from Egypt, sailing to Italy. There are lifeboats which are tied to the side. There are ropes which will eventually hold the ship together. There's an anchor and cargo and tackle, and the ship was moving slow, and they were losing a lot of time. And so they finally got to a place where they should have just stayed still. They should have just paused 
because uh, as Paul knew from traveling that part of the world and traveling through ships, he knew well that it could get treacherous on a big lake or a big, a big sea. Um, those of you who've been out on Superior past the breakers know about this. Um, so the ship was moving slow and they landed at a port and Paul at some point comes up to the, the captain of the ship, the leaders, and says to them, men, I can see that our voyage is gonna be disastrous and bring great loss to the ship and cargo and to our own lives as well. But instead of listening to Paul, the centurion and the owner of the ship just kind of forge on ahead. Uh, and since the harbor that they were in was kind of unsuitable, um, they decided to sail on to another, another place. But during their sail, during their voyage, a hurricane came up. Now, I just wanted to take a moment before we get into some of the last points about hope here. Um, I just want to take a moment to, to, to mention here, like, look, Paul, as a prisoner, is giving advice to a captain of a ship. And um, it's one of those things that I think we should pay attention to because we should have a voice when during the shipwrecked of our society, when our leaders are aimlessly forging ahead, we should have a voice into that. Um, it probably rarely will change things, but we should still nevertheless and have a voice. But you see what's happening in here isn't like an, an over uh, obsession by Paul. You'll see that he's not overly obsessed on trying to make them see his way. He's going to speak the truth. It's one of those things you could fall off on either side of. You can, you can be too afraid sometimes to speak the truth to power. Or other times you can become so obsessed on speaking the truth to power that it kind of consumes your life in a way um, that, that is unhealthy. Paul's not doing either of those. He's being willing to speak the truth to uh, wayward captains of ships. But his job is far more important than setting the course of maritime. As you'll find out, Paul, Paul's job on this ship is not to be a raging prophet, but to be someone around whom everyone can huddle and draw hope out of. So uh, Paul says that, or Luke says that when neither they're in this hurricane situation, rather than being in port, they're being dragged out to the middle of the sea, the mast breaks um, and uh, everything looks like it's gonna be lost. And when Luke says that when neither sun nor stars appear for many days, and I think I just draw so much, uh, so much out of this for us right now, when the sun nor stars had appeared for many days, when we haven't seen one another, when society hasn't been functioning for many months and the storm continued raging, Luke says, and this is where this is the hope part here. When we finally gave up all hope of being saved, everyone, there are 276 people ready to give up hope. And Paul, in the midst of this prisoner, someone who probably should have been chained down in the bottom and disregarded, Paul stands up and says, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. Now, again, listen to this. There's more Paul says here. He's not, this is not an I told you so moment. This is not a, this is not you idiots. Look at what, what has happened. Listen to Paul's heart and identity. He says, keep up your courage. He's choosing to play a role when all looks lost, to be a source of hope and encouragement. He says, keep up your courage. I urge you to eat some of this food. You're going to need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from your head. And after he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. What is, what is Paul's main job as a person of resurrection hope? He's not standing up trying to, to, to give them four points of, of, of salvation. Yeah, that's important. We know that, that and as we cling to Christ, we are saved, and we need to lead people to cling to Christ. 
but he is doing a communion service. Everyone's huddling around him and he's taking the last, the last few rations and he's turning that into sacred Eucharist. He took some bread, gave thanks to God, and he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged, says Luke, and ate some food for themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. And when they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing all the grain into the sea. This, this is Christian leadership. And it's not just for pastors or preachers or Christian professionals. This is all of us being called to be a witness to the, the resurrection for Christ. I'm just wondering about you. I, of course, I've had a chance to ponder this since I've been preparing this, but I'm wondering what your response to this pandemic has been. What's, what's been your posture in this last year? Shock, denial, blame, negotiations, squirming, storming, acceptance. As, as we've all had to travel through some difficult emotions, um, but as Christians, I've wondered if we have asked ourselves, where have I been spreading hope? If you've been with us for the last few months, you know we've been talking about hope and turning it over again and again. And today we're really still with the centerpiece of it all, asking the question about resurrection. How am I first experiencing the resurrection so that in moments like shipwrecks, we can have the poise to offer hope into the circles of our influence. And so a few tips before we close down here. Um, have you grieved through your pain points? Do you have a testimony to share? Maybe your place to start isn't to go out and to insert your voice into a shipwreck moment, but maybe your, your, your job is to do some journaling, get yourself a four point testimony going. Maybe you have open wounds right now that the world shouldn't be touching, but maybe you have some scars from your past that you know Christ has turn from lesions into scars. You should probably just jot those down and be ready to talk about it. Like Mary as the first test, uh, as the first one who's giving a testimony of what she saw. Do you have relationships in your life? Maybe, maybe the, you need to just start with asking the question, how can I invest in relationships? Maybe relationships are difficult for you and you need to ask some friends, hey, give me some advice on doing relationships well. And if you don't have them outside your home, you can start at home. Resurrection and the resurrection power is close by and pulsating through our lives, even in shutdown. It doesn't have to be perfect before you start opening your mouth to being a witness to the resurrection. It doesn't have to be perfect. Of course not. God is taking our poor words and making a great symphony out of them. Uh, but who are the people you know that uh, you, they know that you love them they know that you know their name, uh, and would, would love to would love to hear a word of word of hope from you. And then just live in a way where people have to ask, why why do you live that way? Why why do you seem resilient and hopeful in a time where it's easy to just give up? Um, and maybe some of you today simply just need a reminder that you are called to be on mission. You know, I think there, there are so many poor ways we can go about being witnesses, um, but we can never lose, lose sight of the fact that our identity, our, our linked inness to reality is always comes with a call to be people who are spreading what resurrection around us. And, and maybe you're not in a place where, where you, you're experiencing resurrection or maybe you're not in a place where you're ready to talk about it. But the point of community, the point of being together is that in a church setting like ours, there are always people who are in season, whose testimony we need to listen to. You'll remember that in, Paul, in the story of Paul Shipwreck, if you've read it, that one of the key elements uh, towards the, the, all, all of people's 
uh, salvation there in that in that scenario is that they shouldn't get on the little lifeboats and try by their by themselves to get through the storm. Paul says, if you try to jump ship and get on a little boat, a lifeboat, and save yourself or save you and a few of your friends, there's no way you're going to make it through the hurricane. You got to stay on this massive structure, and this massive structure of the people of God will oftentimes crash into shore and be dragged and be broken apart. Uh, but we will make it to shore together. And that's the safest way. So sometimes we need to lean on other people's faith and other people's testimony for a time. And that's why the practice of community is so important as well as communion. Now, I wonder, I wonder in your life what it might look like for you to get serious about experiencing resurrection. It's pulsating around us, ready for our willing hearts to open ourselves to them. Or I wonder if maybe some of you, I wonder what it would look like who are, are ready or in a season of life that are ready to open their mouths and help the world around them touch the ruins. I wonder just who around you is waiting and eager to hear about that kind of story. Only, only you can answer those questions. And I, I challenge us today to be people who um, do this. What, what difference will it make in Thunder Bay as this whole community is going through a shipwreck experience if the people of God learned what it was to witness to the power of the resurrection. So I'll leave that, I'll leave the, you with that today and we'll, we'll head to communion. So if you have, have some crackers or juice or some wine or bread ready, now's the chance to grab them. I've got a, a few things here together. I love, I love the fact that when you preach and go through this story, um, we're reminded about how powerful communion was in that moment for those on the ship. So Christ, our Lord, invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have failed time and time again of being an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. Gave thanks to you and broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Amen. So I'm going to hand this over to you, musicians. We'll have um, a few songs, I've got a special announcement, and then we'll finish off with a blessing.
as an anchor for my soul with every storm I will hold to you with endless love all my fear is swept up Like a 
Pastor Keith, um, for sharing what's been on your heart and mind as you and Eve uh, continue to discern God's will for you and your family. Um, I think I can speak for everybody at Grassroots Church when I say that we're just so thankful uh, for your steadfast care and leadership at Grassroots Church over the past five years. Over the coming weeks, I invite all of us to be praying for you uh, and your family, to be praying for God's will in the next steps of Grassroots Church. Keith's kind of alluded to this too, but whatever emotions you're experiencing, uh, towards this news, it's okay. Uh, I invite you to give yourself some time to process and reflect. Um, if you feel like you need some help with that or wanna talk through the emotions, um, you can contact myself or another board member um, in the coming weeks. So I just wanna close with a prayer. Uh, please join me. Creator God, thank you for your continual love and your undeniable goodness. Father, thank you for Keith and for Eve, for their family and for their commitment to following you even when it's hard. Please continue to guide Keith and Eve and their family. Protect them. God, give them strength and your true comfort. God, we pray today for the folks who call Grassroots home, that you would also comfort them, be with them, and support them as they grieve and as they celebrate with Keith and Eve in the coming days and weeks. Thank you, God, that we can trust in you. And thank you for your continual reminders throughout scripture and history that you are working for restoration and renewal. renewal. Help us to hang on to your goodness and your hope today and each day. Amen.
So the service is officially ended. You may go in peace.